Welcome to A Skeleton Key to Adorno's On Jazz, the 1936 essay that I think is the beginning of, um, of, uh, of Adorno's critical writings on the sociology of music, or uh, put differently, the critical theory of, of popular culture. The essay predates his uh, Dialectic of Enlightenment, uh, co-authored with Horkheimer by nearly a decade, and it, it, it also predates um, uh, the philosophy of new music by about the same uh, length of time as well. So this is his, his much more, um, what, uh, professionalized or, uh, um, you know, high theory uh, uh, coverage of symphonic music of the early 20th century, especially really experimental and sort of uh, um, leading uh, serial compositions of, of, of Schoenberg and, um, and, 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 and Stravinsky. And, um, and so I, this is a more difficult place for students to begin and for me to begin. Like, I, I still don't know how I would go about teaching uh, uh, philosophy of new music. I, I, it just would present an incredible hurdle. But on jazz can be approached. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I play a little at my, my grandmother's guitar sits in my office. She played on radio years and years ago. In fact, what's really funny is my grandmother played on radio with that guitar in the mid-1930s. I keep thinking about that. Uh, she plays like, like, like folk, country, and a little bit of sort of popular jazz. I know she played um, at, at one point the, uh, the song about, yes, we have no bananas. I know that was one of the things that she knew uh, uh, how to do. But, you know, I, I fool around a little bit. And uh, even I... Uh, ha have have been able to sort of rethink uh, the way that uh, that I approach music and and to sort of make sense of the way that music uh, uh, is fit within um, contemporary culture, the, the way the different streams of music or different genres of music um, either seem to encourage progressive change and and sort of um, a hopeful future, and 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 to me, I find so many forms of contemporary music to be uh, regressive, uh, if not downright fascistic. And um, I think Adorno's on jazz gives me um, a, help helps me walk through the reasons why I have that response uh, to music uh, quite often. So uh, the, the the essay itself um, uh, was published. Um, Again, the version I'm using, published in English, translated by uh, Jamie Owen Daniel in about 1989, published in, in Discourse. Um, I know there's copies of this thing all over the web. So, um, again, that's the one I'm using here. I don't think it's a particularly elegant translation. I still think that this essay has... Um, there's some language issues here. Like, I, I, can, I can sense the... Uh, a kind of clear image in Adorno's mind of essentially Hegelian or, or probably even more importantly Marxian categories that don't always find clear expression in the text. So, so I, I I'm not certain. I again, I'm not. I'm I'm I, how well regarded this uh, translation is. But but anyway, it's a good place to start. It's out there. It's everywhere. You, you should be able to get going on it. And um, it makes a very good uh, essay to lay alongside sort of more uh, commonly assigned, um, uh, uh, you know, pieces on music by by Adorno, like in the um, the Arado Reader, uh, the um, Central Frankfurt School Reader, the essay on the fetish character and music and the regression of listening. This, uh, which is 1938. So this, the, these two pieces, uh, you know, are very very close to each other, and again, provide us a way into um, Adorno's thinking. So, though I, I like to proceed on these things to try to figure out the skeleton key. So, so this talk is not a substitution for reading, it's rather a way for um, to, to, to get inside of the reading. And because this reading is so short, I try to 
think of this piece and this talk as providing a kind of skeleton key to the larger project uh, that, are, that Adorno's up to. So he's, he's developing a critical theory of society, he's a sociologist, um, and, and his analysis of music is fundamentally informed by this sociological worldview uh, that here is really drawn from Marx. I mean, this is Marx that's coming through uh, in this piece, right? And the idea that, that music has been transformed by its um, marketing, that, that it's being marketed as a product on, on, uh, on capitalist commodity markets. So it's a music commodity, it's a jazz commodity. And that means that the use value of that thing is really not what ultimately is determining, right? So the use value of jazz is not the determining feature of jazz. It's its exchange value, its marketability. The the um, uh, so so so, so there, more about that as we go. I'm not certain that, that Adorno is always clean, or at least it isn't always clean in the translation about the, about the uh, exchange value as the as the as the dominant uh, quality of um, of a commodity produced by the culture industry in terms of, you know, determining its, its, um, uh, the way it's produced, how it's produced in the way that it's, that it's ultimately used. Okay. So, um, so, so, uh, yeah. So again, I think like if we were trying to get right to the core, what Adorno argues that is that, uh, there's a kind of a dialectic of popular music that jazz is the dominant form of popular music. To me, this is a piece about popular music, commodity music, uh, culture industry music, much more than it is an analysis of the genre of jazz itself. Today, jazz is a kind of high culture, um, a specialized musical genre. Uh, it tends to be sort of jazz aficionados tend to be fairly well educated. They tend to be quite ur uh, urban, probably quite liberal on average. Um, and, and so it, it's different than it was in his time. So it, 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 he's really writing about about music as music is caught up in the culture industry and it becomes a commodity, right? So 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 even so much music including much of the music uh, uh, known as jazz has a kind of surface presentation, a kind of uh, brand image a, like 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 the picture on the box uh, of of jazz. Um, or on the uh, sheet music, or the picture on the um, you know the album cover, would be uh, a picture of liberation and emancipation, right? That 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 it, it presents itself to us as liberatory or emancipatory. I'm using language that he doesn't quite use here, and that that masks a deep structure of unfreedom and domination. Okay, and so uh, jazz, um, I, I think again is kind of an exceptional concrete reference. Um, that he analyzes, and what I think what he argues is that in many ways, jazz is so important to look at because its surface appearance is so unusually subjective, it, expressive. Um, it, it gives the, again, the kind of, the, it, it promises liberation. It, it, it seems to be freeing. It seems to tap into the libidinal structure of human beings and allow them to release, you know, jouissance or something like that into the world. But underneath that surface to Adorno is a depth that's unusually oppressive, domineering, and um, and 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 so on. So 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 and, and, and that actually undermines and overrides whatever surface promises are there. So I think all music to him probably has this quality. I really don't see much except for maybe Schoenberg's compositions, uh, you know, in the 1920s and 30s or something, is having the kind of full liberatory quality that he would like to see music have. I think he'd see all other genres as being problematic, but I think he thinks jazz is particularly problematic, again, because of its incredible, uh, again, promise of, of, of liberation. Um, and again, the surface appearance, the phenomena that, again, these are WPA images here of, of jazz, uh, I think out of New York, um, and um, it, it, it's subaltern. Jazz originates among, among uh, blacks in America in particular, something he writes a lot about, kind of uncomfortably writes a lot about. Um, and it seems, again, to, to allow uh, jazz aficionados or those who consume jazz seem to enter into a world in which the kind of oppressive, ascetic structure of bourgeois middle-class society is lifted. 
right? So I, I wrote a book with my friend Bill Swart about about NASCAR and, and Sturgis, these largest placement motorcycle rallies that appeal to wealthy middle-class people because they get a vacation from middle-class asceticism and they spend a, a week in degraded milling around other people or they get to release the po at least that's the promise right releasing this this liberatory um, uh, 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 moment and that's what that's what jazz promises you get to enter a space where you get to dance vibrantly, have sexualized uh, 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 movements and feelings and, and so on. And, and uh, again, that kind of uh, liberatory quality to it. And, and, and that's actually um, um, not just something tacked on to jazz. It's at the core of what jazz is. It's, it's the, um, you know, the kind of essence of, of, um, of jazz as a phenomenon. I'm trying to find some other images here. That capture that sensuous, um, uh, you know, again grabs you in, in a kind of an immediate sense. A term that he does use, the immediacy of experience, where you are transported out of alienated existence and placed into um, an unalienated, uh, a, a, a desublimated world of, of pleasures and of uh, again, kind of sexual and and, and erotic. Um, um, and, and, and excitations and so on. Again, often, as he says, with a with with black skin, black faces, um, and a kind of um, what a kind of um, a thematic um, link back to primordial and archaic structures and 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 so on. So again, so also all of this is is part of of the structure. But you know, this is an image from uh, from the. Um, German caricaturist uh, George Gross from about 1918, 1916, somewhere in there, uh, of jazz, of jazz artists and jazz musicians. And I like this quick sketch because it captures to me part of the argument that Adorno is making, that, that jazz, though having a surface appearance of liberation, ultimately is um, it's false, it's pseudo-liberation, it's pseudo-immediacy, and it actually just ensnares the subject right back into a structure of, of domination and does so with probably greater, uh, again, power than what you, um, what, 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 what one might have otherwise. Um, okay, so enough of that. So let's take a look then at a kind of really quick summary. To me, the skeleton key, if you were to go into this article and search for the thing that unlocks it, uh, it, it's mentioned earlier, but it's really summarized on page 67, where he says, Jam is the amalgam of the march and salon music. So those are the two elements, the two, two sort of already identifiable musical genres that have something like tension, contradictory um, orientations to the world that grab individuals who are the subjects of that form of music differently. So the subject of March is grabbed collectively, sort of uh, overpowered by the collective, forced into a kind of objective stance towards a fundamental rhythm, a beat, a march itself, right? Salon music, more high culture, but it has um, a, a kind of subjective expressiveness about it, a lyricism about it, the melodies are much looser and so on, right? That these are two different forms of music that have been... Um, canceled upward into this thing called jazz. And just like I said, it's a false amalgam. Uh, amalgam. It's an amalgam of a destroyed subjectivity and of the social power which produces it, eliminates it, objectifies it through this elimination. Um, it's in true, it, true in coloristic terms of the unity of the pseudo-liberated and pseudo-immediate and of the march-like collective base made of subjective expressive sound, subjective tone, which dissolves itself by revealing its mechanical aspect. So, so it, it finishes up from there, but I think that's the key. So you have this argument that, again, jazz is a, an amalgam. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, again, a cancellation upward of the march and of salon music. And ultimately, salon music is much more expressive, it's, it's individualistic, it's subjective, um, it's, it's, it's freeing, at least it gives the, the appearance of having an immediacy about it, spontaneous free expression, free enjoyment, that kind of thing. Whereas the march, again, is collective, objective. Think of a march, like a military march. 
It's objective sounds, objective regimentation, right? A collective that overwhelms the individual. And his argument is, is that those who participate in jazz basically, again, there's syncopated rhythm, there's all kinds of stuff going on here, which we'll talk about in just a second. But his argument is, is that jazz promises this. It promises a world of subjective freedom and individual immediacy and so on um, to those who partake of it. But in the end, it actually functions uh, in a march-like manner. So so that so basically the idea is no matter what else happens in jazz, it resolves back down to a march. And I, I it, there's more complexity, but I think you can't go wrong just holding that in mind. So think of a John Philip Sousa march or really any of the great military marches of the 19th century. Very, very fixed tempo, unrelenting beat, right? The bass drum, the drum uh, core really is the absolute bedrock of any uh, military uh, uh, or, or, or marching band, right? It's always, always the percussion uh, instruments, the drum core, that's the, that, that, that is the core. And, and, that, and that, that the walk, the march, the regimentation, the, the, um, the rationalization, the overpowering nature of it, right? That, that, and, and really, there's nothing free and expressive about a march, right? And, and, and it's, al it's always about a collective. And so jazz seems to be, again, free, individual, uh, freeing, liberating, but in the last instance, it has that same sort of dominant, overwhelming, um, um, alienating, um, uh, quality that the march itself would have. You become reintegrated, merged back in, in a kind of forced way, back into an already regimented society through uh, through jazz. So again, real fast, like like here's, here's a more complicated summary. I like to draw pictures, but this isn't even a picture, just sort of a list of traits. So jazz, or I, I think, again, I think that the best way to think about this, especially if you like jazz, is that Adorno's not writing about the jazz you like. The jazz you like is virtuoso jazz. It's, it's, it's at, at the least, it's hot jazz, right? That, it, that requires virtuoso musicianship and, and so on, right? That's jazz that you like. He's really talking more about the commercialized um, stabilized, he used the term stabilized, right? The march-like jazz, he uses that term sometime. The commodity jazz, the music commodity of the culture industry. So let's, let's like between you and I, let's call it jazziness, that this is a critique of jazziness. And you know, much of the early sections of the, of, of the article uh, or, or the, um, the essay all the way to some of the ending sections I mean, Adorno really says this, right? Like, like the, the like the public gets it wrong. They hear a saxophone and they think they have jazz. They hear a syncopated rhythm and they think they're in jazz, right? And 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 but it is jazzy, right? And he argues that, right? Like like you can wind up with advertising or commercialized music picking up some of the uh, of the characteristic tonal and rhythmic qualities of jazz and using that to infuse a sense of the modern, the sense of the free, and so on into it. So jazziness is really the essence of his analysis, even though in the last moment, the last sections, he's saying that even the hottest of hot jazz is not liberating. And so, and it's, all right, because it's still the product of the culture industry and so on. And because of the dominance of the march, okay, but but the core of what he's writing about is jazziness, as this this thing gets absorbed in a culture industry that is selling a commodity and and making certain that it's commercialized and stabilized and so on, okay, and march like. All right, so let's take a look here. So 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 what what so the amalgam of these two things of march and salon music parlor music. I'm not, again, it's a form of music we're not really particularly familiar with today. Um, but, but, but in, in the 19th century, literally, uh, composers and virtuoso magicians would gather in living rooms or salons of, of well-to-do, uh, uh, you know, uh, patrons or one of their leaders, teachers would get together with their students and so on, gather in a home, have a little bit of a symposium and play music, right? And, and that composers would craft these little um, short pieces that could be played with great expressive virtuosity on a piano, 
And that's what salon music was. So it was individuated, subjective music, highly expressive, you know, again, virtuoso playing and so on. Um, but, but it gave an impression, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, free, immediate. It was close to music making because each one of the music making is as the sense of creating music in the immediate moment because each composer was essentially competing against others to, to, um, you know, to be pushing the envelope of the, you know, the cutting edge, the, the avant-garde of, of art at any given moment being pushed forward. And so you're competing to do that. So salon music is this expressive, intimate, small space, um, um, not just virtuoso performers, but, but real connoisseurs as listeners, right? Picking up on, 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 you know, the musical, um, sophistication and so on. Uh, so bourgeois or higher, uh, subjective, expressive of feeling, spontaneous, individualistic, had a flow, that kind of stuff all comes out. Um, uh, what's this say? Uh, yeah, um, uh, it's, I, yeah, uh, it's something about your subjective experience of free subjectivity that'll work. Uh, it's closer, like like in like in a, the rondo music form, where you have verse and chorus, verse chorus, the popular music form that began uh, that entered into um, sort of what el elite compositions in in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, the verse is more important than the chorus. The chorus is going to be more important over here. Uh, where there's kind of a, a, a high melodic tonal range, right? Um, uh, again, much more loose, much more expressive, verse-like. Okay, that's that's salon music. And on the other hand, this the other genre is the march, really the military march, right? Collective, coordinated, regimented, overpowering, enforced, unfree. Military bands are the image of that. Um, but it's objective music. It's it, it it's going to permeate a group, coordinate a group, right? Maintenance of unrelenting, fundamental, uniform beat. This turns out to be the key to um, the unfreedom of jazz. Is that in the last instance, no matter how much syncopation jazz maintains, right, or any jazz production maintains, in the last instance. Again, not your kind of jazz that, that's free and, and, and virtuoso, but the jazz that's popular, the jazz that was played on the radio, the jazz that, that, that sold millions of copies and so on, uniform beat. It resolved itself back into a uniform, fundamental, unrelenting beat. And, and uh, so that's going to be really important. The march is linked to dance music. So it's a coordinated movement that's linked to dance. Um, yeah, coordination of collective movement. And the chorus is opposed to the verse of the verse, the individual voice singing melodically. The chorus is a much more constrained, um, I'm using his terminology here, memorizable, repeated message, right, with some variation. So if you think of, uh, of a contemporary song where the individual singer sings with great expressiveness, uh, a verse followed by a chorus sung with a kind of, um, maybe in multiple, uh, you know, part harmony, but, it, but it's much more constrained, memorizable, repeated, right? Most songs are, that are named are named after the chorus, not the verse, right? So the verse is the individual expression. The chorus is the collective voice, right, that's responsive to the verse, right? So the chorus, in, 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 as, so as Adorno was walking his way into music theory and talking about different forms of expression in popular music and talking about jazz, his claim is going to be, man, jazz is all about the chorus. It's chorus dominant. And, you know, uh, um, and other forms of music are more verse dominant, right? Okay. So the, the amalgamation then of march and salon music is is jazz so jazz then has the following qualities about it it's the the key to it all is syncopated rhythm so so syncopation comes about when you don't follow the the absolute fundamental beat but you anticipate it by uh by by having the emphasis on um on 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 an off beat uh you have um um 
Well, well, there's different ways to do it, but you're creating a complicated rhythm that seems to trip over itself or that seems to be out of rhythm in some way. So if you think about jazz or ragtime um, music, it tends to have that kind of that tripping, moving beat to it, right, that propels the song forward. But that always in the last instance, he says, no matter how much syncopation or variation or apparent freedom there might be in the rhythm, it ultimately resolves back down into uniformity in that unrelenting bass drum, okay? Again, not your jazz that you like, that's free jazz, but this is the jazz of, 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 of commercial popularity, right? It goes back into that. So if the rhythm tends to be syncopated uh, and dance music, he says it's dance music, so uh, again, it can't be too syncopated. It has to ultimately have that kind of coordination and routinization that dance music always has. And so, so that's it. And then the sound quality of jazz tends to have what he calls vibrato. So it, so it has a kind of subjective distortion to the musical sound. So you're not just playing an instrument straight objectively, but there's distortion, subjective distortions being added to it, right? Tonal distortions. Um, uh, yeah, so, 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 and then you're taking like a rigid sound and making it waver and bend. That kind of thing. So if I were to play jazz guitar, um, uh, you'd, you'd be bending the notes, like like blue notes. You know, you'd be bending the notes or introducing notes that are out of harmony in order to generate vibration or something like that, right? But it's it's um, you instead of just playing a trumpet straight, you'd be using um, uh, a mute to mute the trumpet. You know, like like the uh, plungers that they were using to mute the trumpet or hats that they were using to mute it. Um, yeah, you know, playing guitar with all kinds of bizarre stressors, using distortion on electrification of instruments, that all comes later too, to add a kind of subjective quality to it. I was recently at a jazz performance where there's a, um, uh, a bar on the uh, electric guitar that literally adds vibrato uh, to, the, um, to every string. Uh, that's being played at the same time. So uh, instead of just vibrating one string by pulling on it with your finger, you're actually flipping a lever and moving a lever around, causing vibration all six at the same time. So so it's that, it's that kind of stressing the instrument, um, stressing the notes, bending the notes, causing subjective distortion, both in song uh, with the voice and in uh, you know the musical background. And he claims that there's actually instruments that are... Um, that have the characteristic vibration and subjectivity associated with jazz. The saxophone is one which he claims comes out of uh, the, the march. Um, the trumpet can be played with a lot of, uh, of, of vibration. The Wurlitzer organ, he says right at the end of the piece, is another uh, uh, um, instrument that generates a lot of vibration and vibratory uh, um, flex going on, right? Okay, so jazz then is a march with the beat but the beat gets syncopated in, in a kind of, uh, what, uh, to incorporate the contradiction of having the free flow of the salon music. Uh, and then the sound is uh, it's more constrained than the high melodic range of the, uh, of the salon music, but it'll, it, again, it, it adds that subjectivity into the objective sound of the instrument and the kind of, uh, of the march-like uh, band by, 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 by the bending and the, uh, again, the subjective uh, distortions that are entered into this. The chorus is emphasized over the verse, right? Uh, and the, so the domination of the subjective and the individual by the uh, instrumental, uh, by 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 both the instruments in the course and the instrument of uh, instrumental reason itself, right? By the rational, by the regimentation, the regimented, by the collective. Okay, so it's like dance music that dominates and um, rather than liberates the individual. If that makes any sense. So that's the basic uh, uh, article in a nutshell. That jazziness is this series of traits, syncopation, vibration, uh, chorus over verse, domination of the objective uh, uh, sound that's been only subjectively bent um, over the, uh, you know, the kind of free uh, immediacy of, 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 of individuality. And it's dance music, right? And that's what it is. So anyway, that's that's the key to the to the book is that that sort of sum 
summary of those two things. Okay, so again, to Adorno, jazz is an unusually good empirical referent to analyze, to make sense of the unfreedom built into in late industrial capitalism, right, or late capitalism, right, the era right before, um, uh, uh, you know, the, as the fascists were taking over, right, it, because it has that surface appearance that emphasizes freedom, free expression, subjectivity, liberation, and so on, and it, it so it has that, and it has this, this underlying, unusually oppressive, domineering beat to it, the dance music, right? So it takes those contradictions that are going to be present in virtually all music produced in the culture industry, and it's going to have them push to kind of, um, uh, the contradictions are going to be pushed to kind of an extreme here, okay? So it's an unusually good uh, thing to analyze. Um, all right, let's try to, I'm going to use my notes here just to kind of walk through as fast as I can now uh, to walk through his argument. So on page 45, um, so he says, you know, defining jazz is difficult. We've just done it, summarizing what he does. But again, to him, it's dance music, dance music. The function is dance music, right? With a decidedly mod modern character. And he talks about, he uses the word resistance. So that so it isn't smooth, harmonic music. There's resistance is built on. There's resistance in the... Um, in again in in the rhythm and there's resistance in the harmonics of the sound right so um yeah so i think we've got that so he says it's kind of it, it kind of has the contradiction of on the one hand having a lot of mechanical soullessness to it that kind of rigidity of the beat and the syncopated rhythm on the other hand it seems to again have licentious decadence to it so again those two things that underlying unfreedom of mechanical soullessness coupled with that licentious, expressive jouissance, right? That's on the surface of it. The march and salon music, that fundamental, unrelenting beat of the march that is here. This is on page 45. So synchronization then is the rhythmic principle most commonly done through the displacement of the basic rhythm through deletions or slurring. There's false uh, uh, rhythms that are sort of generated here, false beats, breaks that are entered into. We just literally like like leave the beat behind and, and seem to be going off in a completely different um, rhythmic structure. But again, it always resolves itself back into the original beat, at least in the jazz he's concerned with here. Again, not the free jazz the, of virtuosos that even he admired, but rather the commercialized, stabilized jazz uh, that, that, that he's analyzing here, jazziness, right? So syncopation and virtuoso piece can be extraordinary, says, and very complex, but the fundamental beat is always maintained. So that's the thing. The beat is maintained. So on page 46, he says, rhythm is key to jazz. Um, the fundamental beat of the bass drum functions as dance music. It's maintained through the syncopations. Uh, that, that fundamental beat is maintained through the syncopations, but always resolves itself back into that beat. So the the gross rhythmic, I can't, the, my German's bad here, but that but that overarching or fundamental rhythm holds, right? So there's um yeah, so the and the measures are maintained throughout too. Their authority remains unchallenged. So again, to me, this is the key to this. Whatever jazz is, it has that unrelenting beat of jazz music that it doesn't let go. All right? with the bass drum as being uh, crucial here. The sound is simultaneously excessive and, uh, and, and, and it also has rigidity to it too, it's objective. But the uh, vibrato is the sound component, it's the vital component here, the tone that trembles, subjective emotions without actual disruption, right? So if you, if you uh, bend notes and cause vibrations and, and, um, and, oh, and sort of um, dissonant overtones as you're playing, um, or singing, um, it doesn't break the basic harmonic structure and harmonic resolutions, but it adds that kind of subjective feel to it, right? So it, like syncopation, it, 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 it allows for the expression and the surface appearance of subjectivity. And the instruments are the saxophone and the trumpet, he says, are two that are particularly good at, at this, you know, the, because the saxophone is sort of a mutant uh, itself between woodwind and brass, and it generates a kind of uh, vibratory sound. So jazz sound, then, is determined in the end by letting the rigid vibrate, right? Producing interferences between rigid and excessive, so vibrating as the physical interference in an object fixed social uh, uh, formation. That's the basic 
uh, argument that he's making here. So uh, got this out of order. Um, page 47. Um, the jazz form is determined by its function as dance music. Um, and this is kind of its secret, this is kind of a secret quality to it. Uh, degraded popular forms of jazz. Jazziness, again, jazziness. I was trying to come up with a term here, and I'm going to stick with it. Jazziness, the jazzy march, and so on, versus thoroughly uh, syncopated hot music. So throughout, again, Adorno keeps setting aside hot music as being excessively syncopated and resolving only at the last instance back into the beat. So it's freer. And then he also is setting aside, on the other hand, more commercial, degraded forms of jazz, stabilized jazz that doesn't have the hotness to it. So hot music refers to, you know, really excessive levels of vibration in all kinds of, uh, of sound tones and so on, and, and complex harmonics and, you know, nine-tone chords and things, coupled with real uh, syncopation that, that, that seems to not resolve it back down until it actually must. So jazziness from uh, syncopation or saxophone becomes taken by the public as jazz, but it's simply jazzy uh, uh, elements that are being added in to give something the feeling of jazz or the kind of surface appearance of it. So jazz isn't what it is, it's what it's used for. Jazz or jazziness. Uh, oh yeah, page 47 and 48, he says comment about the detective novel. So jazz is like a detective novel in that it's a sort of a, 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 a it has a lot of rigidity and stereotypy uh, a, a built into it, stereotypology. Um, so like the murder in a detective novel, a good detective novel, it doesn't just have a murder that enters in and walks off, but the murder itself has to be identified throughout, that the structure of the whole has to support the identification of the murder in the detective novel. And in the same way, this, this vibrating alien subject of jazz, who's singing away in jazz and so on, quivers and marches at the same time. That the quivering that goes on has to ultimately be fit within this overarching structure of the beat that doesn't relent. Okay? And again, my, my, like, it, it's just true of, the, uh, of detective novel, and I think as you see in other of, of Adorno's writings, and Horkheimer's writings, but Adorno in particular, is that this is a characteristic form of life in late capitalism. This idea that 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 our lives are overdetermined or underwritten by this this unrelenting structure, this instrumental reason, uh, the pro, you know, the, the, this search for surplus value that doesn't go away. So page 48, what is the function or use value of jazz? That's all about, it. he says, he says, jazz likes to sell itself as the nullification of alienated thing-like quality through music. So you can overcome your alienation by going to a jazz club and singing away and listening, that kind of thing. And, and that's what it sells, but he says in the end it doesn't do it, right? It doesn't create the pure immediacy of experience and spontaneous enjoyment that it sells. It doesn't do it. But that's what its use value is to those who uh, purchase it, right? Or at least that's what the appeal is, is that it's going to overcome alienation. His claim is it actually increases alienation instead. So uh, on page 48, there's a good quote about the commodity fetishism. Uh, and, and the relationship between exchange value and use value in capitalist commodities. So he does mention it here. Um, all right. So page 48, immediacy appears to be present in the improvisation of the syncopation. Uh, there seems to be a lot of individual spontaneity, but like Adorno says, these are just surface presentations and underneath it, is um, you know, but and, and, and that 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 the improvisation and stuff is that it actually something that can come in ex externally, um, and he talks about the commodity form requiring a, uh, an ongoing importation of external improv into it. So you have a kind of a, a, a rigid form, a stereotype commodity, a standardized commodity that needs to be ever new. And the ever new element is just something like arbitrary that's picked up. So the, the improvisation and sort of um, creative syncopation in jazz isn't actually free creative expression, expressiveness. Instead, it's a necessary externality that's brought in in order to sell jazz as an ever new commodity, even though it really isn't ever new. So page 49, spontaneous emotional quality of jazz is a pasted on ornament. By the way, Adorno's name actually means ornament, which I think is kind of funny, but it's a pasted on Adorno. Um, 
And so that, yeah, the description of jazziness then is that it negates alienation, is liberating. That's what the self-description of jazz, that's what the deception is. The lie that jazz sells is that it is going to help you overcome and negate alienation. Um, and, and as he said, that's, that, that's, that's the lie, that's the deception, because in the end it doesn't. And again, that this commodity, this, this culture industry commodity, more than others, is selling this. Like at its core, the core product it's selling is that liberation, that, that, that moment of jouissance, of immediate enjoyment, right? Spontaneous enjoyment. Um, and it isn't. It, it, it ultimately um, is, is reinserting the jazz subject back into um, the, the order of, uh, of late capitalist society. So page 49, the free subjectivity and spontaneous emotion of jazz is pasted on. We already have that. That which is alienated is endurable. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so ah, I just forget about this stuff. I don't know. I, I, these are side points. Jazziness appeals to elite and mass taste alike because it is the inexorability of the social authority transfigured into something um, um, primitive and original that it seems to be nature. And he said it appeals to those who have mutilated instinctual structures rather than those who are freely expressive of their uh, libidinal joys and so on. Page 50, differentiation is made between the virtuosity of the best jazz performances, hot jazz, and primitive elements that have been added into jazzy, popular, cheap music, commercial music, right? So jazz, again, isn't really the core of what he's analyzing. It's really jazziness, and, uh, and which he says is pseudo-democratic. It's actually fastest. It's actually reactionary. There's a good quote about that and about the middle of page 50. Bottom of page 50 writes about jazz as a product of the culture industry directly. Page 51, um, hot virtuoso jazz and is distinct from commercial jazziness in the same way that the best uh, pseudo-modern um, painters are uh, uh, related to Cubist advertisements. Now, I reread that later, and I thought, well, maybe it isn't exactly what he's saying, but I think he is. He's getting at this idea that there's um, that the virtuoso jazz, the hot jazz, the really good jazz, isn't particularly popular, but it lends a kind of uh, tone of authenticity and an air of upper-class um, status to uh, to the common jazz, right? So, um, so in the same way that 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 Art museums that display high-end cultural products of, of, of painters and so on lend legitimacy to the use of cheap Cubist uh, tricks in advertising. I think it has that same sort of function to it. Um, okay, so why do you have a jazz hit? What determines a jazz hit? Page 51. Why do you get one song as a hit, not another? He said it isn't virtuosity. It isn't genius. It isn't the quality of the sound or the quality of the writing. It isn't even magic, right? Uh, so it's not charisma. It's not charisma. Page 52. It's the total system. The to So I love this thing. So, you know, in Max Weber's Sociology of Domination, there is a contrast between charismatic forms. In, in Max Weber's Sociology of Music, he claims that the melody is always the charismatic voice in music and that the chord structure underneath it is the rationalization of it, right? The rationalization of it. That there's a system, a total system that determines it and that the charismatic voice bounces around. And this is, is kind of interesting. What, what, what Adorno says is that that total system requires the um, appearance of irrational anarchy in the midst of overdetermination. That's what jazz sells. It, it sells the promise of free, irrational, um, 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 almost random elements being added in rather than being overdetermined. But he said, look, in the end, there's no correlation between the quality of music and, um, and, and the success of music. So it's the falseness of society that is made manifest in the selection of some of the worst music as the most popular, right? Or that, that the hits aren't the best ones. The hits are often some of the worst, and that's this notion of kind of a false totality, right? So the false origins of jazz, he talks on page 52, an archaic forces 
tribal people, uh, black uh, faces, black skin, black Africans, that kind of thing. But again, it gets kind of uncomfortable here to write about this. I'm just going to repeat it as he more or less says, because it's kind of integral to his argument. So he says, black jazz is actually a brand name. It lends authenticity to jazz, right? So page 53, jazz is deceptive. Um, uh, it is deterministic underneath, um, right? In the same way that all uh, yeah, uh, dance music is highly rhythmic, has an unrelenting beat, right? It's deterministic in that way, though it has this surface appearance of, of, of looseness, of, of, of kind of irrational ornamentation and so on. Uh, on page 53, quote, skin of black men function as a coloristic effect in the same way that I think he says the silver metal of the saxophone does, right? In contrast to the, uh, to the Rom people, the gypsies in, uh, in Salon music of the 19th century, that with this idea that, um, that the impressionistic compositions that wound up in Salon music and in uh, impressionistic symphonic productions, that there was a claim that this was coming from the folk uh, music from rural villages and so on, the subaltern origins of music. But in the end, he said, look, this is urban manufactured products, that jazz is a manufactured product of a culture industry. It's an urban phenomenon. And it, if, it, if, it's, if it's branding itself as tribal or rural or black or slave or African, it's doing it as again as a brand. It's not doing it out of authenticity, and so it's not it's not um, yeah. So it's not triumphant vitality that is being expressed. That that's not the spirit of jazz. It's kind of a parody of colonization in um, yeah uh, in in bright musical commodities. So again, Ur Jazz, the first jazz, the original jazz, he says probably came from, uh, or it's as likely to have come from domestic servants as it did from tribe, tribal songs and tribal music. Um, and he says, quote on page, yeah, what is this? This is on page 53. I love this line. Society has drawn its vital music um, not from the wild, but from the domesticated body in bondage, right? It's like it's 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 slaves in the American South and it's, it's uh it's domestic servants uh, for jazz. So page 54, jazz is not uh, the recovery of lost instinctual freedom, but it's actually regression through suppression. Again, if it, it, this isn't a celebration of tribal people living in spontaneous immediacy. Instead, it's the music of oppressed um, uh, subaltern groups, right? So it's if you so that the music itself is 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 people who, who are living in mutilated circumstances, right? Um, so it's these new repressed and mutilated instincts that are being expressed here, and those who partake of it and dance in it and use this as the as a kind of core cultural identity are themselves um, um, identifying with those mutilated instincts that are carried by it. So it's not um, uh, originary libidinal joy, but it is repressed, mutilated instincts that are being that are coming out of this in the production, reproduction, and consumption of jazz. So the commodity character of jazz, again, this is on page fifty-four, um, is a, that the is illusion must constantly. Yeah, this is it. This is one of the dialectical contradictions of jazz. It has to always be new and always remain the same. So it has to have the appearance of being free while it's always already regimented. So these contradictions are over there. So he says the composer who's writing jazz music has this problem where they have to have their music sound just like everything else and be original at the same time. So is jazz collective, archaic, primitive, and uh, spontaneous? And the answer is no. And then here, is it the expression of of the creative impulse of a spontaneous individual, he, it, what he keeps coming up with is no, that this promise of jazz isn't realized in its production in the culture industry, right? So new elements are revealed, uh, irash, excuse me, are, are added on um, from outside. A successful uh, jazz hit or jazz hit um, unites one individual characteristic element with utter banality on every other level. This is page 55. So even the most new, fresh jazz um, is, is only new in one limited way. Like he says, like the word banana 
is enough, right? Uh, to 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 spur the uh, the hit, the new hit. It's banal on every other level, right? But that's that's it. So the new element uh, is often placed in the title, the first lines. Uh, Etc. and it functions as a brand. Like in the rondo form, again, he keeps talking about the rondo, the chorus, and the refrain structure of popular music that, again, became part of, of uh, the commercial music of the late 19th, early 20th century. It's, it, that, that, that new element is going to be expressed in the title in the first line. It's going to brand the song, right? So the rondo chorus refrain form uh, is E. Yeah. So the, the chorus, not the verse, it's called the refrain in... in uh, Continental uh, uh, writings about music is that easy to memorize, easy to market phrases are going to be repeated over and over again in the chorus. Yes, we have no bananas. We have no bananas today. That kind of thing, right? Okay. Um, so page fifty-five. Um, so you have a dialectic. I'm trying to summarize here. So you have a dialectic on the one hand of individual uh, a character and creative expression. On the other hand, you have banality, right? And an indifferent quality to, uh, to the new elements that are added, added in. Um, there's uh, the actual creator, he claims tends to be the arranger of the music rather than the composer. So it's the person that puts together the full arrangement, which he said winds up being kind of div a division of labor. And if you've got an already existing group, you know, the, the, the drummer's gonna play in the characteristic way the saxophonist, the guitarist, and so on. So the arrangement is where the originality even is, or the determination of how this thing is going to sound, not the composition. He says, actually, writing for jazz is, is it's just so indifferent and banal, like the, the dumbest, simplest things almost work better than something that's complex and, and uh, has a lot of refinement to it. It's the reproduction of the music that matters more than its original production. So the producer of the score or of the original song versus the reproducer in, in this arranged form, that that's what really matters. That's where the virtuosity lies uh, versus the sub extreme simplicity of the actual composition, okay? So, so he's outlining this kind of dialectic between, again, banality and creative um, uh, virtuosity uh, in jazz. And again, so is it is it is it a virtuous expression of a creative individual? No, it's um, it reintroduces into the composition. Um, yeah, so so oh yeah, he's got this argument. This is kind of interesting. He says jazz is better <laughs> in in that sense because. Um, because in artistic music of the late 19th century forward, there is a fundamental alienation of the person who composes the music and those who reproduce it. There's no freedom for the reproducer. If you're a musician, you're mechanically reproducing the, um, the symphonic uh, composition, you know, reading, your, 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 uh, uh, reading music and reproducing it rigidly, and no scope for, uh, for um, improvisation. And so you're alienated. And he says that, that at least in jazz, there's more um, scope for, product, for, for creativity among those who reproduce the music. Page 56, jazz is not improv or, uh, or, or, or expression of fundamental creative freedom. The reproducers of the music uh, are permitted to, I just love this idea, this is on page 56, this great quote. The reproducers of jazz are permitted to tug to pull at the chains of boredom, even clatter the chains of boredom, but they cannot break them, right? So they're locked in. So, so, so there's more expressive freedom in the reproduction of jazz than there would be in most symphonic music, uh, artistic music, but it still ultimately has that underlying structure that must be um, uh, resolve things back down into it. There's a division of labor in jazz production it's not composed by a single author, but produced or reproduced by specialists. There's a kind of rationalization to it. Um, but again, but he says it, there's limits to this. It isn't exactly like other forms of capitalist production, that there, there's kind of a pseudo quality to it, a kind, that it's kind of a, paradox, a, a parody almost of the division of labor, the way that this plays out. And I'm not going to go into the full detail on that. It doesn't even seem that important right now. Page uh, 59, the appearance of collective immediacy versus stabilize, uh, uh, yeah. So again, this is where he's parsing the jazz world 
And again, this is it. It's like, um, it's just in the same way that Irving Goffman has a, has a book called Forms of Talk where he claims that radio announcers or even lecturers like to pretend that they're giving fresh talk, that it is the immediacy of the moment that's generating all the words when in reality there's a script underneath it and it's been rehearsed and practiced. The same here in jazz. That jazz has to generate the appearance of immediate of immediacy. So if you watch jazz uh, performers um, or even films of jazz performers, there's going to be um, a lot of goofing around, and that's not the right word. Um, goofing, he calls it comic and eccentricities and things like that. But 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 you're you're going to be displaying that you're in the moment producing, right? That you're caught up in it and so on in a way that. Uh, uh, other artistic forms of music aren't going to do. So it has to maintain that appearance of collective immediacy in a way different from other forms of music. And, uh, and again, like Duke Ellington, who he writes about, who I like, has stabilized symphonic jazz um, impression. Uh, let me see. Oh, yeah. Let's just leave this behind. Yeah, again, it's just that same idea that in the last instance, jazz resolves itself back down to this something approximating a march. The commercial forms of it do, the stabilized forms do. Page 60, subjective individual jazz, jazziness, um, is close to salon music. So page 60 is where it's going to really begin a kind of delving into salon music and that in that individual expressiveness. So that subjective individual expressiveness and jazziness is linked to salon music. You want to announce something soulful as you're playing or singing. The jazz vibrato gives that complex harmonics and expressiveness and adds that subjectiveness right to it. Uh, uh, just as in, so the subjective pole of jazz is salon music, he says on page 60, right? So, uh, so it's a social product that's reified into commodity form. It trembles from the impulses of the salon, that intimate salon, right? So jazz is a combination of the march and salon music, page 16, 61. Again, here we are again, uh, salon music, Social, socially produced illusion of individual expression and free emotion and soulfulness, whereas the march is a fictive community of enforced um, alignment, right? This is page, This is his phrasing here on page 16 and 61. So again, in, in the march, you have the basic rhythm that underlies it, that beat that always holds the drummers, the drum core that always holds it together, the bass drum in particular. Um, and uh, yeah, the instruments, uh, yeah, that, the, the instruments that dominate are those that have military uh, band, you know, marching band uh, backgrounds. Um, yeah, so in jazz, uh, jazz is transformed easily into the military march. They're very close together. And he said this can be easily adapted for use in fascism. So he has a line in here where he basically says that the soundtrack, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the soundtrack to fascism is going to be jazz. This kind of march-like jazz, the jazzy march, basically, right? And that's on page 61. Harmony, uh, uh, harmony based. yeah, uh, Germany, oh yeah, Germany banned Hot jazz, but only hot jazz, and that, again, march-like march, march -like jazz was tolerated, and again, uh, a part of what, what, what you're going to get here in, in the thing. So, march-like jazz, page 61, the march is rationally um, disenchanted dancing. That's what the march is, rationally disenchanted dancing. It's the dance with the magic removed. I really like that. I'm, I'm paraphrasing there a little bit, but I really like that idea. The dance and the march are close together. And that uh, the dance and the jazz gate and the march are uh, are you know so close as to be uh, co uh, co determined almost. So page sixty two, jazz dance seems unmarch like on the surface, but because the dancer seems released from exact gestures, but um, uh, and and it released into apparent freedom, but ultimately it's just arbitrary movement and contingent regulated movement that again that resolves itself back down into that fundamental beat. 
So jazz has hits of contingency again, where chance words or scraps of the everyday, like banana, cheese at the tray station, and Aunt Paula who eats tomatoes. I tried to find cheese at the train station and Aunt Paula who eats tomatoes as jazz. There's something got lost in translation there because I can't find a jazz with those uh, lyrics. But uh, page 62 is where I think this is really important. So this is like, we haven't talked about this at all, but on page 62, 63, 64 on into 65 is some of the best writing, I think, in the essay. He makes this argument that the surface appearance of jazz is sexual, often even obscene. That the content of jazz right on the surface is sexual, um, sex acts, sex liber you know, right? It's, it's in the phrasing, it's in the movements and so on, right? Uh, the performers often make uh, sexual allusions and so on. And he said that this is a flipping over of Freud's dream analysis. So in Freud's writings on dream, the manifest dream content, the thing that presents itself to you, often is stripped. That's the wrong word. It often doesn't have sexuality or uh, aggressiveness in it. It seems banal, right? So you dream about, um, uh, I don't know, about rebuilding an engine with uh, the priest that you had as a third grader or something, right? I mean, you're having this, this innocuous dream. And that, that the dream work, you, right? Because that's basically what he does when, when he's analyzing a dream, is that he's reverse engineering the dream work so that you wind up getting to the latent dream structure, the sexual and erotic and, uh, uh, you know, the, the socially uh, 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 unsupported uh, uh, drives and, and, and desires that are being transformed in the dream work into this manifest dream con. So in Freud, underneath the, the, uh, the sexless and aggressionless um, surface of the dream, rebuilding a V8 engine with Father Foley, right? That kind of thing. Underneath that is a latent dream structure of sex, eroticism, and so on. But jazz is the opposite. And uh, I, I was just talking with uh, one of my students in here the other day about, about uh, contemporary um, uh, hip hop uh, or rap music. It's very similar to this, right? On the absolute surface, almost in every phrase, is ma the manifest content of jazz is sex, overtly sexual or overtly aggressive, right? Killing and all that kind of stuff is right there. So, so the symbol. So on page sixty, he says this symbolic representation of sexual union is all over jazz, right? And so, um, so what is so if that's the manifest jazz content? What's the latent? It can't be sex because he says sex is on the surface. So you wouldn't have a surface appearance of sex and then have that be the thing that's repressed. So what's actually being repressed, he says, is much much darker than the sexual things that are repressed in a dream about you and your priest building a motor, right? Instead, it's gonna be secondary, deeper, more dangerous dreams, repressive dream, uh, repression and domination and death actually even, right? S human sacrifice. So when you're dealing with a cultural form that's overtly sexual, it often actually, this is Freud, it often isn't actually sexual. Underneath it is something much darker and much more aggressive. Whereas if you're dealing with something, you know, that, that on the surface is sexual, it's, it may well be masking sex. But if the overt is sex, then there's something else going on. So um, page 62 and 63 talks about, again, the verse chorus structure of traditional music um, in which he argues that, um, that in most traditional popular vocal music, um, the verse is the lead. You lead with the verse, the individual, you know, in American music, there's usually a singer, I can't think of all their names, you know, Dolly Parton or something, singing some individual voice with a lot of subjectivity, expressing vulnerability and longing and that kind of thing, followed by a chorus that answers the individual voice of the singer, usually with a reduction of melodic uh, and, and harmonic complexity, and, and very simple terms repeated, and, and the title is usually in the chorus, right? And so I, I really like uh, Adorno's writings about this on page 62 and 63. What he says is, is that most of the time, that individual voice is subjective, expressive, 
And then the chorus is the social confirmation, the social recognition, the social sort of the communal hymn almost, um, the, the, in, in, in which you, you find yourself identified uh, as part of a group and supported by part of the group. So the, he says uh, the, the verse ego is transmuted or transformed into an identity with the chorus, the collective, merges with it by the end of the verses, right? And then finds uh, fulfillment. He even says sexual fulfillment, but, but that's, that's too narrow. You just find social fulfillment, social support, and so on through uh, through by the end of the song. So a lot, a lot of folk songs like that, a lot of country songs are like this, a lot of uh, popular music songs are like this, where you have the individual voice and then the asking a question or expressing trouble, and then the chorus provides an answer to it. And that if there's multiple verses, which there usually are, by the last verse, the last verse shows that kind of reconciliation or collective identification or the merger, that that the idea being expressed in the last verse of the individual singer corresponds to the message of the chorus itself. So you start out with more distance between the individual singer and the chorus, and, and by the end you get this kind of merger. So that's popular music, and a lot of the folk stuff that I wind up uh, playing with uh, with friends and this uh, this informal group, that's the structure of it. It's kind of stuff I kind of like, right? Where you, where you wind up getting a call and response where the response is the group itself supporting and giving an answer. But he claims jazz tends to have a different structure. Now, I was looking for good jazz examples of this, and I had a devil of a time finding it. I think um, the only thing I found that works, because uh, since he talks about um, Duke Ellington, here's a couple of Duke Ellington songs, Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington. Um, the A-Train song, this comes from, I think, 1939, so it's after this essay. You must take the A-Train to go to Sugar Hill way up in Harlem. If you miss the A-Train, you'll find you missed the quickest way to Harlem. Hurry, get on. Now it's coming. Listen to those rails of thrumming. All aboard, get on the A-Train. Soon you'll be on Sugar Hill in Harlem. So there isn't a chorus, it, or it is a chorus. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like orders or commands or directions being given to an unnamed individual on the part of, um, of, of, I suppose, a group. So it's all chorus, no verse, I guess would be the way that this would work. Um, but it isn't a kind of dialectic between an individual voice and a collective voice where the collective supports you. Uh, it's the voice of the, of, of, you know, again, you're in a city, get on that A train, that A train's your shortest term. I mean, it's just, it's just that kind of, um, uh, the, the collective, the chorus dominates. This is, um, uh, what's the, what's the song here? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, which is like the, uh, the jazz, uh, uh, it, I mean, it, the, the swing music of Duke Ellington, right? That, that transformed, um, uh, domesticated jazz, if that's right, we're stabilized jazz. What good is melody? What good is music? If it ain't possession, something sweet. No, it ain't the melody, and it ain't the music. There's something else that makes the tune complete. Yes, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Well, it don't mean a thing. All you got to do is sing. It makes no difference if it's sweet or hot. Just give that rhythm everything you got. So that's, don't mean a thing, boy, if it ain't got that swing. So it, what I like about this is this is almost Adorno's argument here. In um, in Duke Ellington and a uh, 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 great great hit right from that's that's contemporary uh, to the uh, writing of the essay. It's all rhythm. It isn't the melody. It's not the words. None of that. It all resolves back down into the swing rhythm. Right. Whether it's sweet or hot, it doesn't even matter. Right. So jazz then has the primacy of the chorus over the verse. The chorus is written first, he says. The verse, if it's written at all, is a kind of indifferent, simple-minded afterthought that sets up the chorus. Um, and in orchestral jazz, the verse is dropped altogether, which is what I think happened in the uh, Take the A Train. It's just the individual disappears altogether, and you begin with the chorus. So there's instrumentality. You get a chorus only. Um, and then if there is a verse, it's just a quick one verse, and the chorus keeps repeating, right? And that very simple, it gets some variation to it. It's what's developed, so what sticks in your mind. So it's the arrangers and uh, of, of jazziness that decrease the verse and increase the chorus. So when you jazzify something, that's what you do to it, okay? The arranger makes it look like that.
So page 34 and the theory of jazziness, social function of jazz is to, uh, the latent dream con of jazz is, um, is um, you must, um, even, uh, that hot jazz, that hot jazz, hot jazz has increased artificial, uh, increased artful breaks, mock beats. That's on page sixty-four. You can read it. I think I must have written. Yeah, here it is, right? <laughs> I rewrote it out because I didn't like what I'd written. Uh, so, increased syncopation, breaks, artful execution of improvisations, right? Mock beats, etc. Uh, maintains the beat uh, that is a continual, uh, continued tension between, uh, yeah, the. Yeah, the more, the normative standard. This is where he kind of brings this thing full sociology. That underlying beat becomes the, the the normative standard. And so whatever improv is going on as you get turn taking and jazz and so on is resolving itself back down to that normative standard. And that each individual subjective vibrato or bending of the notes or playing of complicated syncopation, it still winds up being normified again and put back into that unrelenting structure, right? So it's it, it appears to increase individuality, contingency, and so on, but in the and, and departs from the norm and, and so on, but it doesn't actually do that. The jazz subject ultimately gets resolved back down in. So I really like this section here. So he talk, writes about the jazz subject uh, on page... Uh, I think this is 65. He says it's an inept uh, subject that is inclined towards improvisation and has a self that is struggling against an abstract superimposed authority. That's who the jazz subject is. You buy, you go to a jazz club, you listen to jazz music, you like jazz, you buy jazz recordings, you, you play jazz, that's what you want. You're the subject of jazz. You're a self that wants to struggle against to be freed from abstract superimposed authority. However, right, and, and you want to be self-sufficient or taken as self-sufficient, but 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 jazz provides you with a conven conventionally preformed uh, appearance of individual uh, departure from the norm, right? That ultimately uh, doesn't hold, right? So it, that ultimately upholds the norm. So that's what jazz, so jazz gives you a place you can go and dance for a bit. But in the last instance, even the dancing is resolved back down into the norm itself and releases you back out into the world as a normative subject, not a, not a revolutionary. So it's not a free lyrical subject that's elevated into the collective, like in a folk song, excuse me, but an unfree victim of the collective. So he says that, you know, the lead singer, the principal dancer in jazz is often nothing more than a superseded human sacrifice. And he refers here to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, right? Uh, Rite of Spring, uh, which he thinks is the archetype of jazz uh, composition anyway. And he thinks that this, that the, um, I probably won't cite it at all, but, but in, in um, you know, in his, uh, yes, St Stravinsky and the Restoration is the second long uh, chapter in um, The Art of the New Music, right? Where he analyzes, Rite of Spring is like the main uh, a piece of work to analyze. It's a piece that I happen to love, right? But uh, but he says there's a lot of artful syncopation that goes on and the drum beat and so on, and the sa you know saxophone like vibrato, but it's human sacrifice. This is a staging of human sacrifice and music that accompanies human sacrifice. So the syncopation cannot break free, the dancer can't break free, the lyricist can't break free of the group. So you regress back down into the group that ultimately kills you. So you're a sacrificial jazz subject. You may not be killed, but that subject, that, that self that wanted freedom from this abstract authority superimposed on you, loses, right? You, you it, it, And is sacrificed in the process. So the jazz subject then is a human sacrifice, right? And uh, so, and then on page 65 and 66, I really love this stuff. And, and when we talk about film, uh, you can actually see, he mentions Charlie Chaplin here. So he claims that, that the jazz subject wants to be an eccentric 
like a film eccentric or a music hall vaudeville eccentric. But in the end, he says, the jazz subject is a clown or comes closer to a clown. So he has this neat little two-page analysis of the difference between the eccentric and the clown. I'm, I went to the University of Kansas. Kansas, uh, when I was there, was having a kind of Buster Keaton revival. Uh, Keaton was a contemporary of Charlie Chaplin, a little bit well, less well known, but but he was an eccentric, and that uh, there was all kinds of of retrospectives on Keaton's work in film, and that unlike Chaplin, who tended to play a clown, um, where his anarchistic, archaic immediacy couldn't be adapted and couldn't be fit into reified bourgeois life. So he, he didn't fit, right? He didn't fit like, like the famous scene in Chaplin's Modern Times where he can't keep up. He can't, he literally can't keep up with the rhythm of bourgeois life. He can't keep up, but he, he can't keep up because he's inept. And so he's ridiculous and powerless um, uh, and so on. So, uh, but the eccentric, is also excluded from instrumental regulation. They can't, they don't, they, they run on a different beat. So that the Chaplin clown can't keep up. They're inept. They're impotent. But the eccentric has a different beat. They don't fit. And so the rhythm of bourgeois life isn't followed by the eccentric, not because they're not capable of it, but because they've got their own drum, their own beat. So the crank, the outsider, is semi-ridiculous, but also superior. The, 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 the audience laughs at them, but the laughter dies when they realize the ultimate superiority of the eccentric. The eccentric wins. And so he references uh, on page, whatever, 65 or 66, Beethoven's, um, I think it's the Piano Concerto, no, excuse me, Pia, Piano Sonata 32, the Boogie Woogie uh, Sonata, uh, uh, written very, very late in Beethoven's life which has syncopation to it, but it, it's eccentric syncopation. What he says happens is, is that the voice that's syncopated, the, the subjective individual subject of syncopation in that Beethoven piece, right, wins. The eccentric has its own logic, a superior logic, a higher authority, and that apparent arbitrariness is actually subordinated without... Um, rupture to a greater, more, uh, uh, yeah, more, more, more uh, dominant rhythm, right? So fail, so you fail to lower yourself to the rhythm that the others around you, that the mass, you're above it, right? So the eccentric is above the rhythm of the mass, the rhythm of industrial society, the rhythm of late capitalism, they're above it. They're above that beat and they've got their own, right? And, and ultimately they, they, they obey the law yet they are different from it. And so, especially hot jazz likes to portray itself as eccentric. He says that, that jazz artists, often hot jazz virtuosos, will show eccentric freedom the way that they play with their sticks when they're playing the drums and so on. There's a lot of, you know, excess fooling around and bending and so on. But, but, but um, bottom of page 65, he talks about that, right? About the eccentric, the, 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 the effort to sort of, yeah, Beethoven's, uh, number 32, the Boogie Woogie uh, uh, Sonata, if that's the right way to put it. So, uh, so you win. So, so in Beethoven, the eccentric rhythm holds and winds up becoming the new dominant rhythm. But that's not what happens in jazz. He, and maybe it happens in free jazz, but not in the jazz that he's writing about, that, that the culture industry is selling. And that jazz, the jazz subjects that clown, they can't hold. So the syncopation is weakly withdrawn and undialectically and mathematically reincorporated into the underlying fundamental beat. That that's what happens. So you have some syncopation, you try to do things independently or expressively or spontaneously, or at least have the appearance of it, but in the end, you give it back up again as the next performer goes, and, and you go back down to that rigid, steadfast, and so it's impotent clown, right? Unable to change the underlying beat, the eccentric, changes it, right? And that's one of his, so he's got this idea that, that just the content of the music itself uh, is one that, that um, it isn't revolutionary music. It actually gives, it, it, it sacrifices the desire to be free. It, it, it ultimately is defeated as you go back into clownish, so clown-like jazziness. Um, yeah, the subject of weakness, 
Uh, the sex appeal of jazz, he says, is the command obey. Go to the jazz club and obey and follow the rhythm, follow the beat, and maybe you can get a date or something. I don't know. I think that's what he's meaning here. So page 6667, the jazz subject is a humiliated subject. And even, and I like this from a mutilated subject, at one with mutilating authority, jazz subjects are not dialectically transformed by the jazz consumption or jazz dancing or the jazz experience, but they're simply exposed as being comic and, uh, you know, that the parodic elements, the comic elements and hot jazz even reveal this, that there's really not uh, a revolution. This is money making and it's money making that's fit into a culture industry and the culture industry is all about reproducing the structure of domination and you're right back into the central logic of the dialectic of enlightenment, right? That even the new music seems to enlighten and lift and elevate and make the old music passe, but it nevertheless functions as an enhancement of the control and domination of the human subject in late capital. So, they so the jazz subject aspires to eccentric superiority um, and uh, an individual over collective uh, uh, energy, but they're unable to maintain it. Hence, a clown like uh, that there's ironic uh, uh, excess. Uh, yeah, that's okay. And then there's stuff about that. So, fascism takes over the syncopation with other elements. I, I'm a little uncertain about that. I'm not, he's a little, it's a little hard for me to understand exactly what he's getting at here. But, but in the end, he does definitely say jazz and fascism are fully, um, um, they, can, they can go together, and that the jazz soundtrack to the Nazis. Uh, was going to be a real thing, and that uh, jazzy subjects never, uh, yeah, yeah, jazzy subjects never was and never will be that of a thriving production, productive power, but always neurotic weakness, when which you're identifying with your own repression. Okay, so that's it. I mean, uh, it, go back to the first image that we had. It was uh, that that the jazz subjects. That jazz itself is this combination of the march, that routine fundamental beat of the march, march of authority and domination, and the individual expressiveness and subjectivity and free spontaneity of salon music, and that in the end, this is the surface appearance, the manifest content, but the latent content, the real logic, of jazz is this. It's the underlying march-like beat, the military-like beat, right? So, so yeah, so there it is, the clickety-clack of the train, you know, uh, taking, um, you know, people out of the ghetto or something, that this has a kind of um, uh, um, congruence with the, um, with the, that jazz, which seems to be democratic and seems to be freeing and seems to be liberatory, was fully congruent in the end with the um, regime of domination that was taking over Europe and was about to take over the world. So, so that's it. So that's on jazz. Uh, thank you.